So if my prior conversations with Mo and Hadil together are any indication of tonight, you are in for a ride. It is really fun to talk to the two of them together because they're live with their issues and their beliefs and all of that. So we're gonna start out with you, Mo, and just give us a sense of why and how you created the Mo Ibrahim Award and the Ibrahim Index. Um, I, I, I was a businessman, actually. I'm not a philanthropist or anything like that. I'm just a businessman. And I was working in Africa and uh, we developed mobile telecoms in Africa. And uh, we, we took a clear position on the issue of bribery, for example. So we said no bribes, etc. To my surprise, we didn't have a problem. I mean, all what you hear from American business people and European business people is that you cannot do business in Africa without being bribes, which I, I, we found is a little bit dodgy and it raised the issue who initiated the bribing process actually. Anyway, uh, working in Africa also, I, I, I really realized the immense potential of Africa. And there is always this question which Nelson Mandela put very clearly to us, rich continent, poor people. And say, so why? Africa is a very rich continent, huge. And uh, we're not many, not many of us. We're less than India, less than China, less than... And it became clear to me that we, we are poor in Africa because the way we fail to manage our resources, human or material, and the way we run our governments, the way we managed our, 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 our societies. That's why I thought I'm going to devote my life now to the issue of better governance in Africa. Because that's what we need, better governance. Without that, nothing will help. No philanthropy will deal with the questions unless we sort out the issue of governance. And so the idea was that by offering this prize of $5 million for any head of state who stepped down in the proper time and who'd led a reasonably non-corrupt uh, regime, that this would inspire others? We, yes, we wanted to brace the issue of accountability. We, we want to bring this issue of better governments out in the table. The prize uh, is exciting. Everybody says, oh, who's gonna win the prize? Uh, why my president did not win it? or why this guy won it. We need to have a conversation about the role of leadership in the really of the countries. And we're not asking for much. Mm -hmm. We're asking for people to come to power in a legitimate manner. Mm -hmm. yep. And to move the company, uh, the country forward while they went the route. Then they leave office in time without hanky-banky, without yep. constitution changes or, okay? And then they leave with clean hands no blood, no money, no dirty money. Yeah. And we say that's not much to ask. And we say if somebody managed to do that and take billion people out of poverty or move the country forward, they are heroes. Mm -hmm. We want them to know. Mm -hmm. We also wanted to know uh, or to let the people know that Africa has 54 countries. And you ask any, ask everybody in the room here, do you guys know Mobutu? Raise your hand if you know him. You heard about Mobutu? You heard about Mugabe? All of you? Do you heard about Chisano? No. You heard about Mukhai? Festus Mukhai? Muamba? So these are African amazing leaders who did a lot to their country. He came democratically, left in time. Breas, President Breas from, from Cape Verde. Nobody knows it. So what we need is to bring those guys out of the shadows to say, look, those are African leaders. Why you only remember mm -hmm. one or two? You all know ID, I mean, you all know those guys, but you don't know the, uh, so we, even our people don't know them. Yeah. So we really need to present the new role models uh, for, for our people. That's why we, we did the prize. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
And Hadil, were you involved from the beginning of the prize, or was it more when the index got started? So the evolution of the index was that we really needed to find a measurable, transparent, accountable way, a way that effectively reflected the values we were trying to promote. So when you thought about how you evaluate which leader, some of it would be based on anecdotes from people that knew them. Some of it would be based on certain types of qualitative research. But you also needed to have some kind of baseline where you could really look at how a country had performed over the one or two or three terms that the president had been in office. So the index really evolved as a sort of measurement to help the prize committee make their decisions. So yes, I mean, I, very soon after my father decided to set up the foundation and had this idea for the prize, I was um, fortunate enough to be at a moment where I was able to come in, I think initially on a temporary basis, to help figure out how to do this. Unpaid, yeah. <laughs> Unpaid. Unpaid. But, um, you know, I, I, I ended up staying. For quite a few years. Quite a few years, yes. And, and uh, Hadil, last year you spoke to the Global Philanthropist Circle. Yeah and you were talking about the commission you'd served on on humanitarian disaster financing. financing, yeah. And tell us how your comments that you made, which I still remember to this day, relate to the issues of accountability and the index. Yeah, I mean, I think, so I served on a, a UN high-level panel for a year, which was when the Secretary General appointed nine of us from different sectors to look at the humanitarian financing challenge, which to give you a sense of the urgency, the humanitarian budget in 2015 overtook peacekeeping as the biggest budget line of the United Nations. So it's about 12 billion. Um, the global budget of including the UN piece is about, was about 25 billion for that year. Um, so this is a hugely escalating number. What was fascinating for me as someone who'd really worked in the development space before, was to understand not only the challenges of the humanitarian space, but to really see that you had this interlocking development humanitarian climate crisis. And I think it's very easy for us as philanthropists to say, I do this. And we actually sort of reward ourselves for having a very clear vision and being very clear about what we do and what we don't do. We think that's smart philanthropy, targeted philanthropy. But actually, once you got on the ground and saw how these crises are interlinking, and you saw that real life doesn't really recognize silos. So for example, you would find refugee camps that were the product of political displacement. But 20 years later, the refugees can't go home because of climate vulnerability. So what are they? Whose problem are they? And so I think, I think uh, certainly I learned that we all have to be a lot more holistic. I certainly remember saying last year that I don't think we can afford to be single issue specialists. I don't think it's smart to do humanitarian work without thinking about a development, you know, how do we graduate people into the development sector? Or to do climate work without thinking of the humanitarian dimension or the development dimension. So I think we have to sort of embrace this much more holistic, much more synergos, frankly, way of, of, um, of uh, and maybe the one thing I'd say about how it intersects with the index and accountability is that, you know, data, is in the room and in the conversation in a way that I don't really think it was 10 or 15 years ago. And certainly I would say that um, most public policy, at least now, pretends, especially in international development, to be data driven or to have some relationship with data. And I think that's a relatively new development and I think that's something to really be applauded because we are slightly, and I speak for international development specifically, we've seen a move away from this deeply ideological structural adjustment program kind of way of doing development to really talking about results, talking about outcomes, not outputs. And I think that's a tremendous um, development that we shouldn't allow to retrench now as the world maybe becomes more ideological mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. So you have the prize, which holds up a standard, maybe a little bit like the giving pledge, which tries to hold up a standard for what philanthropists will do and to inspire ex-heads or heads of state. Um, and then you have the index, which actually looks at the results. Is it 82 factors that you look? Yeah, what, what we wanted to simplify. Look, when, when we started this 10 years ago, the word governance was not used by anybody, neither the World Bank nor the international development community, nothing. And even when we tried to translate it 
uh, because we need to publish our documents in various languages in Africa, in Arabic, Swahili. There is no word we couldn't find. We have to invent some words. So the governance was like, what is it? It's like something for academics, you know, to talk about. And we said, no, 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 we need to bring governance to the men and women in the street. How we do that? So we wanted to simplify it, to deconstruct it. And we said governance is what? It's about the, this basket of public goods which governments are supposed to offer to their people, to deliver. This rule of law, you cannot have a society without rule of law. Mm -hmm. Under rule of law, there's a number of issues. You need to have independent judiciary, uh, you know, you need to have decent police force, you need to have security, you need to have... So there is that one leg, you know, which is important for the governance to sit on. Then there is the issue of the, the economy, the, the infrastructure, the, 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 the power, clean water, roads and telephones, uh, ports. All these are three uh, necessary really for uh, 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 the country to move forward. Management of public finance, debt, etc., inflation. We need to measure that. Then we needed to measure human development, health and education in depth. And we needed also to manage that soft area, which is rights, gender issues, uh, human rights, uh, ability of people to organize, to uh, form parties, to express their views, etc. So these are the four areas which really governments need to secure to its citizens. We measure about 100 parameters, yeah. uh, you know, and we, that is the most detailed, accurate, and accurate record of governance. We publish it every year for every one of the 54 countries. Mm -hmm. And we score and we rank. So it's something easy for citizens of the country to say, oh, my country is scoring badly in this area. So we can have there can be a, a, an objective mm -hmm. conversation between civil society and the government about achievements. It's not about leaders who can deliver good speeches or they can dance or they can sing or whatever they do, but it is really what they deliver. Here is what we have delivered, that's a scorecard. Mm -hmm. So uh, we thought that's a simple way of, of, of presenting mm -hmm. governance. Uh, we pass this data on to civil society, but to all the MPs, universities, media, etc. Uh, it's just to open that closed box mm -hmm. called governance. Mm -hmm. It is simple, it's measurable, it's easy, it's here. And I understand, at least in the beginning, some heads of state would complain bitterly because they thought they were unfairly treated. Is yes. that true? Yeah, we had a few calls, you know, people say, why? And we said, look, I mean, we don't make up this data. Every number we have is reference to where it came from. Mm -hmm. So we have like 92,000 data entry. Oh. And uh, till now, in 10 years, nobody managed to challenge, to challenge one item because we don't make it. Mm -hmm. And uh, now everybody accepted. It. It's correct. Even the guys who are complaining, mm -hmm. they come and sat down and they looked at the and they said okay sorry hmm. we'll do better next year and Hadil tell me you, you have this annual gathering which you just had in Morocco in April mm -hmm. and who attends that and is that to discuss the index or does it have broader implications so um, this year was very special because it was our 10th anniversary um, but generally, we take a thematic issue, so particularly ones that are obviously relevant to Africa. So we've looked at cities, um, urbanization being a huge issue on the continent, youth, of course, when about half our population is under the age of 18. Um, and I think by 2050, a third of the world's youth will be Africans. Agriculture. So, 
so we've we've really um, tried regional regional uh, integration. So we've tried to make each year thematic and allow us to dive quite deeply. And what's been wonderful about the panels we've convened was, you know, to have the mayors of four or five of the biggest cities in Africa sit down as mayors and discuss the challenges that they face from east to west, north to south, across the continent, but then also to have business leaders, to have people from the cultural sector. Um, and I think it, it speaks to um, where we started this evening in talking about um, leadership being about bridging, and I think the foundation has always really attempted to play this role of bridging between civil society, business, young people, political leaders, because we tried to create a narrative that was around data, it was around accountability, it was around performance. So you, man so you sort of hopefully depersonalize uh, and desensitize the conversation because it's a, it's a lot harder to be offended by a number mm -hmm. than it is by mm -hmm. a position, mm -hmm. right? So um, those, those gatherings, I think, have really gained in, in, in force and we, I mean, we I hope you all come to one of them. Um, but they, they really are wonderful and I look forward to them. And I'm wondering, I mean, in the world in general, there are more conflicts and less trust. I'm wondering whether you're finding through this annual gathering, some of the same people come, they get to know each other, they may even get to know each other across countries or across sectors. Are you finding that you're able to create an environment in that gathering so that you really are becoming a force for a recreation of trust? that certainly was characteristic of indigenous Africa, but that I think has gotten lost around the world, but also in Africa. Yeah, what we, we think of the event, annual event, as a platform yeah. uh, where we do our own conference, but a lot of other organizations also come to do their own meetings and workshops or uh -huh. uh, uh, even board meetings so i mean this year we had uh, we had uh, the one campaign you know bono and all his people they came for the board meeting and they also participated in some of the other areas we had the b team we're talking about the b team which is a group of business people uh, who are working on uh, developing uh, a new narrative for mm -hmm. business I think they have an ad today in the Wall Street Journal. You can see uh, a lot of prominent business people signing this contract. Mm -hmm. That's the work of the B team, which I'm also a me member of the board. So they came, they had their board meeting, and then they had some more workshops. One, uh, for example, was about the issue of uh, anonymous companies or the issue of climate. Uh, change why how business address uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the uh, international crisis group. Uh, they came to to discuss also the issue of uh, uh, the ungoverned spaces in Africa, terrorism and jihadists mm -hmm. and the various things happening, especially in the Sahel. Uh, then we have also a lot of senior personality, mainly African or non-African. We had the wonderful. Uh, uh, speech lecture actually by uh, President Kuhler of Germany about leadership. I encourage people to go to our website and, and watch that. It's only 10 minutes, all the speeches are 10 minutes. We had conversation with Kofi Annan, we had uh, uh, you know, Amina Mohammed, she's the Deputy Secretary General of UN, Nigerian woman, wonderful woman. Uh, she, she gave us a wonderful statement about a woman, African woman in, in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in her leadership position, her challenges. So really it becomes uh, a so it platform becomes like for many different the, issues. Then we have a big football match, we brought the champion of Africa to challenge, <laughs> the, because we, it's a big stadium, because we, all young people in the city, we cannot get them, and all of them into the theater lecture room, but thousands they come. We had a big concerts. We bring artists from South Africa, from uh, Senegal, from really top African art, and, and we have a f free concert at the stadium for young people. The idea is to bring young people into the room. Mm -hmm. Our fellows, 
uh, because we have fellowship programs. We're also very active, uh, some of them in the conversations, etc. Tell, yeah. tell about the fellowship program. Yeah, the, the fellowship, we had, uh, we're not really in, very much into education or capacity building, but we thought we need to do something. Mm -hmm. So we chose an area which we thought uh, we really need to develop uh, know-how mm -hmm. among our people. Uh, so I recall Pascal Lamy, who was, uh, who was a well trained WTO managing director, who's also a board, board member in our board. He was happy to accept a fellow to work with him. And we said, that's a great idea. So we went to a number of friends. We chose the World Trade Organization because as Africans, we don't have the skills how to negotiate in the WTO. Those guys eat our lunch. Really, because we don't, it, you need an activity. I mean, Britain has a big problem now, negotiating trade agreements. They don't have the expertise. It's gone. So it is a specialized area. So we have put a fellow there for a whole year to work with the president to understand really how the organization works. Mm -hmm. We do the same with the African Development Bank. Mm -hmm. We do the same for the Economic Commission for Africa. For various other organizations, we pick up people, men and women, who are 30 something, really top high flyer people. They come and they do. Those people now, they're advisor to the president of Nigeria. There is somebody running the central bank somewhere. Somebody. These are really, we're building that kind of uh, expertise in a crucial area which you think it's, uh, mm -hmm. is needed uh, in Africa. And Hadil, was this something you were involved in developing as head of the foundation? Definitely, and definitely I think I was very active in promoting the concert and the, and the extracurricular activities. She danced very well. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to hear good music. But um, I, I wanted to come back to a point you raised about trust. Yeah. And I think it's something that came up at our table discussion this evening. I think we have built a real community of trust. Um, and I think it's wonderful that I would say 80% of the our, our sort of attendees come back every year wherever we travel on the continent, which says something very, very powerful about the fact that they hopefully think it's worthwhile. But it's, you know, this interesting moment, I, I saw, I think it was, I think it was the White House Correspondents' Dinner. And one of the people speaking said, we live in a time in which trust is more important than truth. And so we have these populist leaders and their supporters trust them. Mm. So there's no truth there's no objective fact that will dissuade them because they trust these people. And I think we have, over the last 30, 40 years, totally eroded, collectively, public trust in politics, in institutions, at the same time as, I would argue, having an international system over the last 100 years that has delivered for the majority of people in a way that has never happened in human history, by which I mean women's rights, minority rights, gay rights, disabled people's rights, um, you know, access to education, access to health. I, I paraphrase President Clinton, who I think has a great formulation where he says that the headlines are bad, but the tread lines are good. Mm. So there's this, there's this sort of absurd disconnect in that we've basically destroyed people's trust in the one thing that's actually consistently delivered the data shows us for the last century. And it's not that these institutions are perfect, but there aren't others that are better, as far as I can see. So I think this notion of rebuilding trust and rebuilding confidence is an interesting one, and how we actually rebuild confidence, not in our own side event and in our own brand or in my local community or within my political movement, but how you actually just rebuild public trust and confidence in each other mm -hmm. and in broader systems and in the idea of politics, I think is a really big challenge. And mm -hmm. I think it's something that we've maybe not, we've addressed within our community, but maybe not thought about how, how, we, how we make people sort of believe in each other again. Mm -hmm. And is that at all related to your motivation for, with Chelsea Clinton, starting the Africa Center? Definitely. Um, because I think, I, you know, I'm someone that believes in institutions. And um, we'd worked a lot with the African Union, the African Development Bank, with the UN for that matter. But these were not institutions that necessarily represented Africa as I saw it or as I knew it. 
And so you have a system where the sort of point of intersection between America and Africa happens via the UN or via the Chamber of Commerce or in all these ways. And it, it felt like at this moment you, you needed an honest broker between these two entities, that w which was this idea to create the world's leading Africa center here in New York and to really look at how you reframe 21st century institutions and say, actually, you have policy and you have culture and you have business and the interesting space is the space between all of them. And I think the Asia Society, which obviously was um, another of uh, the great contributions of your, of, of, of your family to the city, um, the Asia Society is a really good example of that. And we really wanted to um, build an institution that young kids from Harlem could go into and, and access in a way maybe they don't feel comfortable walking into the Met even. Or business leaders from Africa could come and engage with their peers. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's it, we sit as a project at a really interesting moment now because I don't think we imagined four years ago that we would be in a moment where America was maybe retreating from the world. And so I think more than ever, these institutions are so critical because it may be that you're going to have to rely on the Africa Centers and the Asia Societies and the Council of Foreign Relations to, to maintain those links in a way that you may have assumed State Departments and foreign ministries had a really good handle on before. That may not be the Until case. Until they recruit more people in the State Department. Well, I think yeah, we don't know yet. Very exactly. short of people now, I think, yeah. But, um, I, I, think, I think these kinds of civic institutions are very, very valuable. Um, and I hope that we as an Africa Center seek to bolster those other traditional institutions around us rather than undermine them mm -hmm. also. Thank you for that. And I just want to conclude by saying that this is the first time we've honored a father-daughter pair. And <laughs> Thank you. And I, I'd like to comment on the um, creativity and diversity involved in that pairing that um, <laughs> that Mo grew up initially in the Sudan, lived in Egypt, is that right? And went into academia, I learned tonight, and then, by the way, into business. And out of that began to focus on these kinds of ideas. And Hadil, you spent a lot of your life in London, is that right? Mm -hmm. And um, they have, if you get into a conversation with the two of them in a less formal setting, they have certain differences of opinion. <laughs> but because of the different backgrounds that they grew up in, in my view, it adds to their capacity, both individually and together, to bridge across many, many divides within and across Africa, between Africa and Europe, and Africa and the US. And to me, this exemplifies the absolute broadest form of bridging leadership and some of the most effective in terms of the programs that you're putting in place. So I just want to congratulate you personally and on behalf of all of us for the amazing work that you're doing. Thank you, so Thank much. you very much.